Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be part of this event. Um, as you said, um, you, you touched on some of the issues concerning Germany. I think the idea now is just to put some of these strings together to get a broader uh, picture also in the European context. Um, the, the way I'd like to go about is to have short um, statements by, um, by everyone, five to seven minutes, I guess, is the, is the idea. Uh, I'll try to uh, interrupt you if, it's, if you go on for too long. And uh, I'd like to go by um, the order of the alphabet. So um, Clemens Fuß would be um, the first one with five to seven minutes, please, Clemens Fuß. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, excited to be here, uh, and and uh, uh, thanks for the inv in invitation to this discussion. Uh, I suppose I would like to make three points. Uh, if we think about Germany in the next years uh, and compare it to uh, how it fared after the last crisis, I think that this time will be different. Uh, this time will be much more difficult. Uh, if if we uh, remember what happened after the financial crisis. This was a deep crisis, uh, uh, the labor market was in difficulties, uh, government debt went up in Germany as uh, everywhere else. But after the crisis, uh, Germany recovered um, without great effort. Uh, this was because there was an employment boom uh, driven by a strong recovery of the economy, especially outside Europe. Uh, and Germany benefited from that through its export model. Uh, interest rates declined um, uh, and the com unemployment declined and the, and the combination of that allowed the government to, to increase its spending massively, have a large and long-term pro-cyclical fiscal expansion uh, over these years um, uh, without increasing government debt. Now, in fact, government debt, as we all know, the debt ratio uh, declined. Um, uh, Germany benefited from the fact that uh, the, its, its baby boomer generation was at the height of its productivity and of its earnings, uh, and uh, that made things easy for Germany during uh, in this period. Uh, now, as we all know, things were a bit less easy for other countries in Europe, but for Germany, um, you know, this uh, economic boom, this very positive economic development, uh, came without great effort. Now this time it's going to be very different because there is not going to be the benefit of uh, declining interest costs. Uh, interest costs are extremely low so uh, in the short term you know servicing government debt is not a problem uh, but there will not be this additional space created in the budget. Um, there will not be additional space created by increasing employment and there will not be uh, increasing economic growth due to growing employment. Um, because uh, the, in terms of de there's not the potential to reduce unemployment very much and, and the demographics will change direction. So the baby boomer generation in the coming years will go into retirement. That will be a, a drag on economic growth. Uh, and um, uh, it will be a drag on government finances, a very massive one. Um, so uh, companies are aware of that, and that's why they, you know, in their investment decisions, um, they uh, will consider Germany as uh, being less attractive than other locations simply because there are fewer people, um, uh, and that is a problem. And on top of that, we have the entire transformation of the economy, the green transformation, the digital transformation, and this is not to the benefit. Uh, of some of the key industries, as we all know, in Germany. So the car industry, Germany's most important industry, is in the middle of a very complex transformation. A lot of companies are currently reconsidering where they produce, and Germany is one of the losers uh, because it's a high-cost location and its comparative advantage is very much in combustion engine uh, production. So um, uh, as, as we can see, uh, as we speak, uh, the news is coming in that companies are shedding employment. It's not all bad because there are companies in Germany that will continue to have a strong position in, in, in world markets. Uh, but uh, again, the German economy is facing headwinds. Uh, now, what, what, um, what about the Eurozone? The Eurozone will face uh, increasing divergence in the coming year, that's pretty obvious. Uh, we see that the southern countries that were hit by the financial crisis and uh, recovered more 
possibly are again uh, hit more strongly. Uh, at least that's uh, that's what the data currently says. Um, uh, you know that debt ratios will increase. Uh, we will have Italy at a at a debt to GDP ratio of uh, one, between 150, depending on the scenario, and 160 percent. France at 120. Uh, and so on. So the uh, divergence in that regard in the Eurozone will increase, and so will the tensions. My expectations is the Eurozone will more or less kick the can down the road, uh, which works as long as interest rates remain low and confidence, investor confidence remains. And I don't think it's going to go away very quickly because, uh, you know, there is, if you look at other countries and other areas, there are problems as well, but uh, the Eurozone uh, will resemble increasingly a house of cards, not in terms of there being many political intrigues, but uh, in terms of this being an increasingly fragile construction uh, with, uh, as we know, in principle, uh, an institutional framework with a no bailout rule where, you know, countries have to respond for their own debt. Uh, and at the same time, countries being unable to maintain the confidence of investors without uh, support by um, uh, the ESM and the ECB. So uh, this will uh, continue for, you know, this, this, this will can be maintained for some time. What I, my, my concern is that it will be very hard uh, to get back to uh, an economic situation which is so robust that we can confront the next crisis because the next crisis will come within the next 10 years and if we don't get down our debt to GDP rate ratio and if we don't get growth going, it will be very hard to confront this. There is in fact little Germany as such can do about that. Um, uh, you know, what will happen depends on economic policies in Paris, in Madrid uh, and in Rome. Uh, uh, and Germany will have, um, uh, uh, you know, will will struggle to maintain its own growth and to and and to uh, in the medium term, uh, and that's what it will focus on. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Thank you um, for what was actually a pretty gloomy picture of uh, the future. Of course, this was Clemens Fuß, head of the EFO Institute um, in Munich and former professor at um, Oxford University, among other um, universities. I'd like now to, to go to Maria de Metzis, um, Deputy, Deputy Director at Bruegel. She has previously worked at the European Commission and the European, um, and, and the Dutch Central Bank, sorry. Um, Maria, what is your take? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I've, I've followed your event actually the previous days. So congratulations, it's been extremely uh, interesting to listen to that. Um, you know, I, it's, it's very difficult not to share some of the pessimism that Clemens just uh, uh, put forward. I think there is, there is truth in there. Um, and, you know, there is no doubt that the problems ahead are not going to be small problems and, uh, you know, but, you know, let me then perhaps add two more points just to give a, a different flavor to, to the discussion. Um, we were asked to comment on the macroeconomic policy mix for the Eurozone. So on the fiscal side, we have a new uh, tool that uh, it has been actually, if you ask me, maybe not a Hamiltonian moment, but it is remarkable in many senses. Uh, the issuance of common debt is remarkable in Europe and whether it is here to stay or not, it depends. Uh, but in any, in any case, I believe this is an, an incredible uh, achievement. Um, and, and I actually believe that uh, Germany had a lot, of, a lot to do with that. I mean, I think it was Germany who drove, who made that possible. Um, because it is Germany that visibly changed tack when it came to this uh, to this issue, and the question is why? Why did Germany change tack on this, and to what to what end? Uh, perhaps I'll come back to this when I talk a little bit about the external challenges. Um, but I think uh, the defining characteristic of whether this uh, new generation EU will be a success or not will be the way that we govern it. Uh, the governance issue is going to define whether this is a good tool here to stay or a bad tool that we experimented with and then it goes away and we come back to, to the previous status quo. That's on the fiscal side. On the monetary policy side, um, uh, you know, I think there is, uh, there is a lot on the plate for, uh, for the ECB, but I think the biggest challenge for the ECB is that it's what I call it, it has to navigate in the dark. There's just so much that is going on in, in the global economy uh, that affects the European economy on the digital transformation, everything that affects the real economy that the ECB needs to manage in its macroeconomic management and demand management. Uh, that is actually going to be, uh, you know, uh, very difficult to account for this uncertainty. So what I think is important there is not to add on. 
uh, what we call policy uncertainty. It's important not to add policy uncertainty to what uh, the, the, the ECB has to do. And here, you know, it's, uh, you know if you allow me, I think the, the Constitutional Court decision actually added to this uncertainty. Um, and I think it's important to reflect why this happened. You know, a lot of the narrative was out there in terms of challenging the independence of the ECB. Um, I'm a bit confused about that because typically we think about independence in the context of independence from the executive. Uh, nobody's independent from the judiciary. I think we are all accountable to the judiciary and the ECB is also accountable to the judiciary. But the question is which judiciary, and this is where the uncertainty came in, to the extent that the uncertainty of the judiciary side is possible in the context of the Eurozone, I think we need to do whatever we can to remove it. Uh, because that does not add to the difficulties that the ECB is going to have to follow in the future, irrespective of what your view is uh, in the direction of travel uh, when it comes to monetary policy. So I think it's important to remove that and any other uh, policy uncertainty. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about a little bit in terms of, you know, thoughts uh, that I would like to bring to discussion is the external challenges. I mean, there is no doubt that the ability to meet external challenges uh, will, uh, will be conditioned by how well we meet our internal challenges. Um, uh, but there are uh, certain things that I, I believe the, the Eurozone, maybe Europe uh, more generally, is lacking behind, and that is the vision of where we are on the global, on the global scene, on this global order, on multilateralism. Um, and I don't mean on foreign policy. I mean, foreign policy is, of course, an important aspect of it, but I mean more about the, econo the economic foreign policy, if you like. The role of the euro. Uh, I, I don't believe that uh, the euro uh, can really challenge uh, the dollar if we don't have a big scale uh, safe asset. I think that's, uh, you know, maybe the new generation fund is uh, a first step to that, but it's certainly not the last step. And at the, at until we have a big safe asset, uh, we will not have a bigger role for the euro in my view. But the multilateral system, and uh, what we mean by that, the global governance and who is writing the new global book is something that I think Europe needs to, this, to, to, you know, to have more of a view on because it's going to affect its production capability. It's going to affect its industrial policy. It's going to affect its ability to become green uh, in the future. So understanding the global order, how, who's writing, who's holding the pen in this new global rule book that we are in the process of tearing down, right now, uh, you know, we need to have a, a, a more con concrete view on what China, uh, what is China, what is the ambition of China, what is inevitable about China and what is not inevitable about China, and where does Europe stand in this? The ability to speak with one voice, and I come back now to Germany, uh, is, is crucial in this respect. Why did Germany cha change tack? And, and I would say, I will give you a view and perhaps you can challenge this. Why did Germany change tack with the new generation uh, EU? Why, why was there such a big difference there? And my view is um, that I think Germany has really wanted to be proactive when it comes down to creating a strong Europe to meet the external challenges. And, you know, I think this is what Germany had to give in to uh, in order to, you know, unite uh, uh, Europe, or at least make one step towards uniting the many things that separate us, and, and therefore have a, a much more of a consented view uh, that will help us deal with global challenges. Perhaps I'm wrong, but I'd be delighted to hear your views on this. Great. Thank, thanks a lot. I think that external dimension is a very important point. And uh, we have Lukas Gutenberg now, who is Senior Research Fellow and Deputy Head of Research at the Jacques Delors Institute here in Berlin. So I'm sure he can, uh, he can talk about what has changed in the German position and what probably not has changed. Lukas, your turn. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark, and thanks a lot, Thomas, for, for putting this together and for inviting me. Um, actually, I would like to challenge a bit what Maria just said, um, because I don't think the German position on Eurozone matters has fundamentally changed with the recovery instrument. Um, when we look at what has characterized the German position over the last years, basically since Maastricht, there were three characteristics. Um, the first was that the uh, dominance of federalism by exception. So the idea that, that there shouldn't be um, federal permanent institutions at the Eurozone level that would get a life on, of their own and that would in a way work in a preventive measure or a way um, to deal, for example, with microeconomic imbalances or with fiscal policy, but that we basically only have the ECB as a federal institution, and then we have institutions like the ESM, which are only there in a crisis and can only be triggered with a very high hurdle. I think when the recovery instrument is basically the same. We have it as a one-off that comes in this crisis that will go away and that legally it is very clear that this is not a permanent feature. The second um, feature of the German position had always been a strong um, level of intergovernmental control. Um, and that is again true also for next generation EU. There could have 
been um, legal ways of, um, for example, allowing the EU to borrow in a less invasive manner, but uh, we have that now, and I have to get technical for a second here, in the own resources decision, which means that all parliaments will have to agree to this, all parliaments will have to agree to change the way the EU can borrow in the future, um, and that means the hurdles are again very, very high, and it's um, a pretty intergovernmental setup that we see also for the recovery instrument. And I think the third feature that we have always seen in the past is a pragmatism in the um, choice of instruments. Um, Germany has never been um, very, very strict um, on the choice of instruments, but it went always as far as it had to um, to solve the problem of the day. And I think there was a realization in Berlin in, um, in the spring that loans wouldn't cut it this time, that we would need some form of transfer. And borrowing now at the EU level is just much, much cheaper than um, outright transfers um, to the hardest hit countries. And I think that's why um, it makes a lot of sense to go this um, way from a German perspective. But so I think the German position has, has evolved in the face of the pandemic and no doubt that was very important and it could have gone another way. But it's not a paradigmatic shift. It's really an evolution of the same position. Um, and I think that also means we have an open, a very open question where Germany stands on a lot of structural rules and issues that are still unresolved. And let me just add three here. The first one is the fiscal rules. Kim and Fuss already alluded to that. Um, we will have to come to a political consensus after this crisis. How do we apply the, the fiscal rules, um, in particular in the face of very high debt in a lot of, of member states? This debate is not for almost a technical question about like the structural deficit or something, but it's really a question um, of a political consensus. And this will be inter uh, intimately linked to the German debate on the debt break. And I think there's absolutely no consensus within Germany on this. Um, and so the German position on this for, on, at the European level is very unclear. The second uh, thing I wanted to highlight is banking union. Um, this might become relevant uh, sooner than later. And I think the German side has so far never really embraced the premise behind banking union, which is we want a European banking system that could be seen very um, transparently in the Commerzbank Deutsche Bank saga. But it has also not really embraced the rules of banking union. If you only look at not LB, um, where things were done in a way that at least were not completely in, in line with the spirit of European rules. And we might have to fa face a judgment call very soon, um, whether the European rules on banking in banking union are really applied and whether we then you also use European money to shore up banks in different member states. And the third part uh, is of course the question of the Hamiltonian moment. Do we get to a more permanent fiscal policy at European level? Um, I think the, the finance minister Olaf Scholz has uh, like called on this for this repeatedly, but of course next generation in EU, EU is not that Hamiltonian moment because it's not a permanent feature. And I think also on there, uh, on this question, um, it's very, very open. Just to, to conclude, there are a few signs that make me hopeful that we could see a, um, a structural shift in the German position on some of these questions. Um, first, public opinion has been very, very favorable to the German position now on next generation EU. Um, for the first time, the CDU, which is by far the most important veto player in the German debate on Eurozone issues, has embraced a step at the European level wholeheartedly, full on, and not like the ESM grudgingly with a lot of doubts. And I think that shows in the polls, like it hasn't hurt the CDU and it hasn't shifted public opinion to become more skeptical on these issues. And a lot of it will depend on how well next generation you will, will, will work. But I think that's a very, very positive step. The second part is that I think it's clear to everyone that we cannot over rely on the ECB forever. And, and but this is part of the German strategy or like a central part of the German strategy in German position so far. Um, and I think that is in a way, uh, it's bad that it had to come to this point, but I think it's, it's encouraging um, that we see the debate shifting. And finally, I hope that the elections next year could be a moment where we get a debate on European issues um, in, before a federal election. Olaf Scholz has said he wants to put the central in the, in the campaign. I'm very curious what that means in terms of substance, but at least to have a debate on this in an election campaign would be very good um, because last time what we saw is a strong the coalition agreement on Europe without an electoral mandate beforehand and maybe it could be the other way around and then we would have a government that actually has a mandate on Europe and we then have a French president in 2022 who hopefully also has a pro-European agenda and that could perhaps provide a moment 
to solve some of these more structural eurozone um, institutional architecture questions that Clemens Fuss already alluded to. Uh, thank you, Lucas, for your thoughts. There, there's, of course, a, a saying by the German philosopher Hegel that uh, at a certain point, a change in quantity becomes a change in quality. And I think it's probably for the debate later on, I find it interesting whether we are at that point in, in Germany on which we just keep on adding um, incremental step by incremental step, but it's so certainly maybe we are still in another game. Um, I now like to call um, on Philippe Legrand. Um, he is a consultant and writer and has been an advisor to the European Commission and the WTO, among other institutions. I can't see you at the moment. Philip, are you here? I am here. Yeah. Floor is yours. Uh, I'm also a, a senior visiting fellow at the European Institute at London School of Economics. Um, I've often been uh, very critical of the German policy establishment, so I want to start by acknowledging the constructive steps that the German government has taken uh, to support the Eurozone uh, this year. Uh, whether it is uh, supporting, suspending the application of the Stability and Growth Pact rules, whether it's the massive um, fiscal stimulus which benefits demand uh, both in Germany and its trading partners, uh, and of course, crucially, the agreement between uh, Chancellor Merkel and uh, President Macron that led to the Franco-German agreement uh, that forms the basis uh, for the uh, Recovery and Resilience Fund. But as I've written uh, in Project Syndicate, um, while that is a welcome step forward, um, the Eurozone's fundamental problems remain very much um, unresolved, and they include uh, Italy's unsustainable debt dynamics, uh, Germany's uh, deflationary bias, uh, and the lack of a fiscal uh, rebalancing mechanism. I think it's important to make the point now that fixing these problems is not solely uh, Germany's responsibility, uh, but it does have uh, a crucial uh, role to play. Um, as George Soros has rightly observed, uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, always does just enough uh, to keep uh, the euro going, uh, but uh, nothing more. If we are to create a more stable uh, and uh, inclusive eurozone, uh, not one uh, that just hangs together for fear of the costs uh, of falling apart, uh, then Germany needs to be um, uh, much bolder. And let me briefly touch on three issues, fiscal policy, uh, monetary policy, uh, and uh, imbalances. Now, starting uh, with fiscal policy, uh, at the very least, uh, Germany needs to avoid the mistake uh, that it made a decade ago uh, when it swung prematurely from embracing stimulus uh, to uh, demanding austerity, uh, not just domestically, uh, but across uh, the Eurozone. I think the Stability and Growth Pact rules need to remain suspended uh, for uh, the foreseeable future. And in the, mean in the meantime, uh, we need to devise simpler, uh, more flexible uh, and uh, more growth-friendly rules that act counter-cyclically, not pro-cyclically, and that take account of the policy stance of the Eurozone as a whole. The 60% uh, of uh, GDP debt threshold is completely outdated. The reliance on poorly calculated structural deficits is absurd, and the application of the rules is much, much, much too complicated. If we have to have fiscal rules, they should focus primarily on a, a simple criterion, uh, like uh, debt interest payments as a percentage of GDP, which is a much better measure of debt sustainability in an era of low interest rates, and which takes account of the interaction between fiscal and monetary policy. Alongside that, I think we need to have uh, steps towards uh, uh, fiscal integration for the reasons are given by um, some of the other speakers. And, I don't, and I'm not convinced by those who say that uh, the recovery fund um, indicates a greater willingness to move towards that. On the contrary, I mean, I agree with Lucas. I mean, it was basically, it was approved on the basis that it was exceptional, uh, that it was time limited, uh, and with big rebates, of course, for the so-called frugal four. There's also a big political risk uh, that it's going to be badly spent, and that actually will therefore end up undermining uh, the case of fiscal integration. And of course, it operates uh, at EU level, uh, not Euro level. So I think German support, uh, wherever it comes from on the political spectrum, uh, for a permanent and significant uh, Eurozone budget with debt issuing capacity, along the lines suggested by President Macron, uh, is absolutely crucial. And if we have the frugal two or frugal three Euro members not wishing to participate, uh, then let it proceed initially um, uh, without them. I think my biggest worry 
uh, is on monetary policy. Not so much the position of the German government, but that of the German Constitutional Court, which has challenged uh, the legal basis, not just of uh, the, the QE program, uh, but also the ECB's ability to backstop the monetary union. Now, of course, we all know the ECB is formally independent. It's not subject to German law, uh, but it does operate uh, within uh, political constraints. And I remember very clearly back in 2012 when I was working with President Barroso, it's absolutely inconceivable uh, that Mario Draghi uh, could have made his uh, whatever it takes pledge in 2012 had he not secured Angela Merkel's consent beforehand. Which is why, even though the Karlsruhe ruling recent one is not binding uh, on the ECB, it can of course order uh, the Bundesbank uh, to withdraw from asset purchases. And that threat in turn uh, raises uh, the political cost of the ECB of proceeding with measures that the court does not approve of. And that in turn uh, may lead uh, the ECB to tie its own hands in unhelpful and dangerous ways. For instance, it could um, you know, jeopardize the flexibility of the PEP program and indeed its ability to take uh, exceptional measures in future. So if the ECB is to continue to backstop the monetary union, it needs to be able to credibly commit to act in open-ended, uh, potentially unlimited, and yes, disproportionate ways. And, and things could come to a head, I think, uh, when um, the PEP program comes to an end. That's now planned for next year. Even more importantly, the reinvestments are most supposed to come to an end at the end of 2022. And that is just a few months uh, before uh, Italian elections, um, which are due no later than May 2023. And given that um, ECB asset purchases can involve only temporary divergences from the capital key, the ECB is going to have to be selling Italian bonds at that time, and therefore that's going to be a very dangerous moment uh, for uh, the Eurozone. One last point uh, on imbalances, which has also been touched on. I think it's, you know, and, and there are positive signs, Germany needs to put uh, its XF savings um, to good use uh, domestically uh, by investing much more uh, in its future. Uh, hopefully we can move beyond the debate of the past 10 years of fetishizing um, a, a um, no, no government borrowing and instead invest in the future. Failing that, um, Germany can do more to invest productively through its companies um, across the Eurozone rather than channeling its excess savings into financial speculation uh, through uh, its banks. At, at a European level, we need to enforce um, the macroeconomic imbalances procedure that's a job for the European Commission to do, and it's a job for, the, for Germany uh, to uh, abide by. So on those three points, fiscal, monetary, and imbalances, there's a lot to do, a crucial role for Germany, uh, but also uh, much more that, that uh, Germany's European partners need to do too. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Um, it's excellent. Thanks for highlighting the challenges uh, that are ahead of us. Um, I'd like now um, to uh, go over to Antonella Sirati. Uh, can I can't see? Oh yeah, here you are, uh, professor at the University of Rome, and where she's working on inflation, wages, and other macro uh, issues. Please go ahead. Now I can see. Right. Okay, thank you very much for for the invitation. A lot of interesting points have been raised uh, so far. We don't have much time, so I will try to touch on on three points. That is to say, the vision of the economy of the function of functioning of economic systems in behind the rules and institutions uh, in Europe. Uh, the, should we aim at fiscal transfers and what is the alternative and then a few words about the recovery fund. So on, I quite agree with the pessimism, let's say, of many of those who have spoken before in the sense that I think it is true that the Europe and uh, the Eurozone particularly is a very fragile uh, contraction. <clears throat> um, one of the reasons, not the only one probably, but one of the reasons of this fragility is I think that it has been built on a set of uh, rules and institutions who are, uh, you know, inspired, let's say, by a view of the economy, which is false. Which, what is this false view? The, view? the view of the economy 
as something that is capable of adjusting spontaneously to some kind of potential output and equilibrium unemployment, which are supply side determined. So that, you know, fiscal policies must be very moderately counter cyclical. In fact, they have designed, we know that they have been designed in such a way which is in fact pro cyclical. Uh, but, you know, the idea is that basically the central bank has to intervene only you know, with regard to prices and for the rest is the, you know, spontaneously somehow the economic system takes care of everything else. So I think this vision should be, it should be, I mean, of course, it's being discarded by facts and also by many economic theorists, but it should, this should penetrate uh, the discussion within European institutions and also in Germany. Unfortunately, many positions uh, which we see from outside, let's say, that are being taken by, by German economists or German politicians, etc., are based on this view of the economy. This has to be discarded. There is no ten spontaneous tendency to any supply side determined potential out. Demand matters, and it affects what we are, what we usually call potential output. So it affects productivity, it affects labor force participation, it affects the capital formation, and so on. Uh, and if we, and this must be, you know, must become part of the discussion. Otherwise, the rules will be based on these false premises, and rules based on false premises are bound to be either not respected, and this has been the case of France for 10 years, always deficits above what would have been the rules, or they can be extremely damaging, as it has been the case for Greece and for Italy, Spain, and other countries after 2008. Large part of the increase in Italian debt after 2008, or rather I should say after 2010, is due to mistakes, if you like, in the policy prescription from European institutions, okay? Because that caused a huge fall in GDP and then an increase in the debt to GDP ratio because initially the central bank did not lower interest rates as, as everybody else was doing in the world, but increased them right after the, the financial crisis. So all these caused an increase. In, uh, in that to GDP ratio in Italy and I suppose also in other countries. So these rules have to be overcome. What uh, should be um, the root? I, unlike many, many colleagues um, and also many politicians, I don't think that the progressive route, I'm not convinced that the progressive route consists in more fiscal transfers because uh, across uh, nations. Because we are not a federal state, we do not have the political institutions in the first place that characterize a fiscal, a federal state, not in the Eurozone and even less in the, in the wider European Union. And I do understand that uh, German people or people in other countries and their government may be worried about having to, you know, transfer resources to other nations, to other peoples. We see that happening, and this is not nice perhaps, even within countries. I mean, Catalonia doesn't want to transfer money to Andalusia and the Northern uh, Italy doesn't like to transfer the, the much money to the Southern Italy and so on. So this is not uh, something that can happen to a large scale in Europe where people do not speak the same language, do not have the same institution, when there is no unifying political setup uh, with a democratic mandate, a political representation, and so on. So I think what should be done, though, is to realize on the part of Germans, governments and people, that in order to avoid large-scale fiscal transfer to other countries, the, it must be possible for these countries to grow 
and not to suffer economic uh, you know recessions and unemployment and so on by their own means in a sense by using economic policy macroeconomic policy tools so it should be you know i think one should create a, a situation in which these countries have a lot more scope for using fiscal policy or industrial policy or regional policies to help uh, um, reduce the huge divergences that are emerging in Europe. And I think that there are two sides of it. One is to recognize, for example, that instruments such as some form of soft monetization or hard monetization of public debts is not a fiscal transfer and is not inflationary, not in the present context. Okay, uh, so um, this could help at least keeping very low interest rates, ensuring the continuity of these and the rollover of debt would allow countries which have a higher debt um, to, you know, to use to have sp fiscal space when they need it. I think the rules internal to the Eurozone should be changed, getting rid of potential output denier and all these very troublesome concepts and very fragile concepts. And perhaps go back to an old idea by Okun, which saw the target for macroeconomic policy in a particular unemployment rate, which is reasonable to suppose is the fictional unemployment rate in a given country, say somewhere between 4% and 6% according to economic structure, or this could be, this unemployment rate could be uh, regarded as the lowest unemployment rate reached by that country in the last 10 years or something, because this demonstrates that it is feasible for that economy. Okay, without high inflation. That should be the target. And until the target is reached, the fiscal policy and perhaps a bit of regional and industrial policy should be allowed to the government of that country. Of course, with some constraint. What should be the constraint? There is a fear that this, this could re lead to inflation. Okay, let's say that this can be done, but only if the country can do that policy without reaching, say, more than 2% inflation rate or something like that. Uh, another constraint that is a real objective constraint is the external balance. So imports should not exceed exports for more than something or for more than a certain period and so on. So it could be, there could be a revision of macroeconomic rules which leave more scope for to individual countries for putting the you know something close to full employment and improvement in the growth performance more productivity etc having the fiscal space to do it otherwise it's a vicious circle for countries which don't have it some of the divergence after the pandemic is caused by the fact that Spain and Italy, although very badly hit by the, by the virus, have spent much, much less than Germany in, uh, in, the, you know, in facing the pandemic because they are, they are afraid, as what was said, there are uncertainties about the continuity of monetary policy. We don't know whether and how fis uh, fiscal rules in Europe will be reintroduced and so on. So uh, I think these uncertainties must be removed. The last point is the recovery fund. I think the recovery fund is a very good thing, not because it involves much of fiscal transfers. Italy, I did some, you know, uh, calculations. In the end, if the sum is entirely given to Italy according to the rules which are now uh, designed, uh, the, the proper transfer would be 30 um, billions overall. Uh, all the rest, loans will be returned and also a large part of the so-called so um, grants, in fact, will be financed by a contribution by Italy as well. So it, it's not good because it involves a lot of fiscal transfers. Not, ma not much, particularly if one considers that Italy, for example, has been a net contributor to the 
budget, European budget. Um, what is important is the tool, the possibility of having a common debt at low interest rate, very long maturity. Very long maturity, I think, is a very important key so that you can spend now when it is needed, a deep recession, and then return in a very, you know, very slowly, very gradually in a far future when hopefully GDP will have increased, prices will have increased, and so the, the, the weight uh, of, the, of the debt will be much less uh, important. So I think it's a very useful tool. This, this kind of things should be encouraged because they allow to do things that have an, a macroeconomic impact and um, at the same time do not involve much of fiscal transfers okay so they can be uh, can be accepted and i think that uh, you know I, of course the recovery fund is useful macroeconomically if it doesn't go along with the introduction of the usual fiscal rules that would impose cuts in the national budget in other for other, for other yeah. entities and um, and so it is very important that we do not return to the old, the old fiscal rules and that the the idea behind the recovery fund might be extended for example for creating infrastructure mm. of european interest thank you okay. thank you um thank you i'm sure we come back to the issue of um, how to change the rules and make them um, more suitable for the situation um now, um, last but certainly not least, Martin Wolf, Chief Economics Commentator at the Financial Times and one of the most uh, influential economics uh, journalists on the globe, I would say. Martin, please. We can't hear you. Is your microphone on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. It should now work. Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. I apologize. So, I have been the victim of what I have often referred to as um, a particularly vicious form of discrimination that nobody worries about, which is alphabeticism. Uh, um, so I'm nearly always last in a group like this. And this means inevitably that everything possible has already been said. So all I can do is repeat it or argue with it. Um, I think I'm probably going to repeat it more than argue with it, but uh, that is the pain of having a large panel and being last. Okay. I'm going to make a few fundamental points, and they're quite simple, not, I think, terribly technical. Um, there's been quite a lot of technical discussion, and I think uh, we need to think about um, this in a much bigger way than economists are doing. I'm in the middle of, well, I'm virtually the end of, of uh, uh, writing a book called The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, and one of its conclusions is that economics as a profession is a catastrophe. And I mean, I mean that with absolute seriousness. It's not an unadulterated catastrophe, but it's an almost uh, unadulterated catastrophe when it gets into political domains, which don't work on the same logic. Now, uh, my points here is I thought 30 years ago that the Euro was at the very least a huge gamble and probably a big mistake. Um, it needed, in my view, a political union to operate, a view which I think most Germans held and which I agree with then and agree with now. And the fact that this was impossible would make it very difficult to operate. And I believe that subsequently proved to be true. However, it is an, it has also proved essentially irreversible. And this, and for other reasons, means that it must be made to succeed. By the way, I also argued in the 1990s that if we didn't join, the UK did not join, we would end up leaving the EU. And I turned out to be right on that too. So it took 23, four years for it to, 20 years for that to be proved true. So that's the first main point. This is an incredibly difficult challenge to make this work among, as has been pointed out by previous speakers, such vastly different countries, culturally, politically, socially, and economically. Um, but it has to be. Second point, I believe the health of the Eurozone, which hasn't been really discussed here, but presumably in other panels, is an existential issue for Germany, given its scale, its location, its size, uncomfortably small to be a superpower and uncomfortably large to be a big, to be a small country, um, and its centrality, of course, in Europe. 
And there are four specific challenges of the moment, which make the survival and success of the Eurozone as the core project of the European Union absolutely central to German interests. First, the obvious dissolution of the West as a political idea. And I don't think Biden will reverse it, though I think he might attenuate it. Secondly, the transformative significance of the rise of China as a superpower. Third, the ongoing and in my view, probably irreversible breakdown of important aspects of globalization. And fourth, the challenge of managing the global environment and the global commons. It was because of these challenges that I thought Britain's decision was particularly insane. Uh, but it's, it means that Germany must make the Eurozone succeed. The third point, uh, since the Eurozone has to succeed, Germany as the continent's leading power must do and think whatever it takes that it, to ensure it does so. And that means fourth, and this is where I will elaborate a little bit more, Germany has to get rid of a whole slew of thinking which worked beautifully for Germany as what I think of as the largest small open economy in the world before the Eurozone was created into being part of what is not a small open economy. Now this has many dimensions, but I think the most important are, um, was the idea that the natural, and I think this fits very well with what my previ the previous speaker said, but I'm saying it in a slightly different way, which is the idea that the right way to do macroeconomic adjustment, which really meant economic adjustment, is by avoiding any form of uh, vile Keynesian macroeconomic policy and relying on supply side adjustment via the external account with monetary policy supporting in normally in a pro-cyclical way, principally through the exchange rate. That was a brilliant system for post-war Germany. It is completely unworkable for the Eurozone. Um, the Eurozone is a large closed economy uh, that's sort of a long-term structural condition. It has to have a demand policy as the US has, or as China, of course, has, without even thinking about it. And worse, right at the moment, we're in a situation of global chronically deficient demand, as shown in the extraordinarily low interest rates of the past 12 years and the unbelievably low rates of today across the entire yield curve, nominal and real which means monetary policy is not fully effective. I think history is relevant in considering this. It is true that in the early 2000s, Germany adjusted its macroeconomy with enormous success through its classic model via wage suppression and the external account, generating a massive surplus. Unfortunately, that also generated endogenous bubbles in other Eurozone countries, which blew up in the financial crisis after the global financial crisis, essentially the same classic German model was used, but this time by the Eurozone as a whole, every member of which, with the exception of France, is now in a current account surplus. This imposed massive slumps on many member countries from which they have, in considerable measure, failed to emerge ever since, even before COVID-19. This simply cannot happen again. The external demand is not there, as has been pointed out, and it will blow up, in my view, Eurozone politics, politics in at least one member state, if not more. Just look at the attitudes people have to the EU as shown in polls. Italy is a very classic example. Do not underestimate the power of poli populist politics. It can blow it all up. Just look what's happening in the US, we won't go into there. So there has to be a demand and growth policy for the Eurozone. Monetary policy, of course, has a large role to play. This has been discussed, but it has limits in current circumstances. There has to be a Eurozone 
wide fiscal policy, whether it's done through national means or Euro, Euro, Eurozone level means, I don't really care, some combination, but it's the only way for a grown-up currency union to operate. And of course, as part of this, as Philippe has mentioned, Germany has to eliminate a large part of its current account surplus. The counterpart deficits will not be run stably anywhere. They will not be run stably anywhere. What do you think Mr. Trump's trade policy is about? Um, and of course, COVID-19 has made this all more urgent. So let me, that's sort of where Germany has to rethink. The crucial point I'm making is the economic and political health of Eurozone member countries has, as a result of the decision to join the monetary union, may become a primary domestic matter for Germany. It's a primary domestic matter for Germany. So there must either uh, be a move towards a fuller political union or some other way of in internalizing all the relevant externalities within the politics of the member states and particularly in Germany. And if that doesn't happen, given the, the enormous challenges which Clement rightly described at the beginning of his, in his contribution and the other contributions that the Eurozone and all the developed countries now face, certainly dramatically my own country, I am very concerned about the future. Thank you, Martin. The, there's, of course, one advantage of coming last is that you can set the tone for the debate. And uh, in this uh, sense, I would like to kick off the debate sticking to the bigger picture um, with a provocative thought, uh, perhaps, that if I look around in the world, you know, I see the US, which has a lot of problems at the moment in terms of political stability, also economic um, instability, social instabilities. Then there's China, the other big uh, area, which also has, a, has its own problems, this tendency towards authoritarianism and sort of the idea of just you can paper over these um, divergences but just by um, surveying people. And then I look at Europe, which has problems, but a social model, which probably is more inclusive than um, the US model, um, which with institutions that might be weak, but they're developing. I mean, stuff keeps uh, being added. So is it actually true that we are, are we bound to be the losers uh, in Europe on the world scale? So it's now open for everyone. Just if you, if you want to say something, just say it. Let me just respond very quickly since it replied to me. I think the answer is absolutely no. I agree with you completely. I believe passionately in European civilization. Uh, uh, and I want it to succeed and thrive. And your starting point is correct. Uh, but I don't think you can assume that it will last indefinitely. The thing I've learned most clearly in the last 20 years is that complacency about the stability of social and political arrangements is very dangerous. Uh, none of us, I think, 20 years ago thought the US or UK would go the way they have. And if I look around Europe today, Germany is a model of course, in this regard, but it's not on its own in Europe. And there are plenty of countries with enormous stresses upon them. So I wouldn't, I just would warn against being complacent. Anyone else? Yeah, Maria? Yeah, I mean, just if I can add uh, maybe a couple of thoughts on this, uh, I think for the moment, at least, uh, it feels very much like uh, Europe is the, the, um, the continent to conquer in the sense that the US is trying to push the EU to do something and China is very much involved actually in trying to sort of understand whether this is a playing field for China. And Europe is actually very passive when it comes to this. It doesn't have an active role to play. It is what is it that we want? What is the end game in globalization? Where, where do we want to be in that system of multilateral governance? And what is that globalization gonna look like? And this is my second point. I mean, you know, it's not obvious to me, um, you know, what the global multilateral system will look like and how Europe can contribute to that. Uh, can you envisage in, let's say, 100 years from now, what is, where is the role of, where is the center of gravity in the global scene? If you look at just population trends, so, you know, that's inevitably is going to be in the East. Um, so, you know, this the Western model, as somebody called it, I mean, where is this Western model and what can Europe achieve with that? And that has got implications about, are we going to trade with each other the way that we trade today? Can we still benefit? Uh, from open uh, trade, but also in a more sort of distribution, well distribution uh, aspects of trade, uh, it's not obvious to me what the end game is going to be. And therefore, it's not obvious to me how can we design today to get there. 
Um, uh, but, but I mean, I think that this is something that the Europe needs to be a bit proactive for. If you are a big a supporter of multilateralism, open trade, as indeed, you know, Brussels as uh, sort of the, the one voice for Europe when it comes to issues of trade, multilateralism, free trade. Well, how are we going to achieve that in a model which is actually extremely polarized? Maybe to follow up then, um, so, so yeah, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Just, yeah. just an observation of you. I'm not sure about, I, I really find very difficult to make predictions uh, for the future, so I don't, I don't know if we are going to be the losers. But certainly the Eurozone has been the loser in the past years, in the sense that we have grown much less than other areas in the world, than the US and, and other parts of the world. So again, this goes back to the point I made about the wrong premises of macroeconomic policies, because even if Germany is a success case, even Germany has grown less than Sweden, let's say. So there is something that has to be changed in the macroeconomic policy of the Eurozone. Philip? Yeah, I think building on what um, Martin has said, I mean, the context in which uh, the EU and the Eurozone have developed over the past 30 years uh, is over. The area of um, uh, globalization underpinned by uh, US hegemony, where basically um, uh, the EU could act as if geopolitics doesn't matter, uh, and indeed dream that the EU system was going to be applied globally. Um, uh, that is over. And there's a reevaluation of that you can see in trade policy, where the EU um, does have the means to act, um, there is a reevaluation of that uh, to a certain extent uh, in investment policy. Uh, there certainly isn't the means to do that um, uh, in the crucial financial sphere. And I think that has to be a key argument, I think, in Germany and elsewhere about the need for uh, creating a, a common uh, Eurozone asset uh, and a common and large, um, deep uh, Eurozone or wide uh, capital markets. Uh, to give um, uh, the Eurozone the strategic auto autonomy that it needs in this area. And last but not least, because we are talking big picture, uh, in security uh, and defense. Uh, and if you have uh, big players such as um, uh, the US and China um, uh, willing to use um, uh, security issues uh, as uh, a geoeconomic weapon, uh, if you have an economic pygmy like uh, Russia willing to use um, uh, security um, uh, to achieve its interests, then the, the Europe needs to be able to do that too. And of course, that creates um, uh, huge challenges, not least for Germany, which uh, has been a free rider on, on Western security for so long, uh, and where for obvious historical reasons, there are um, uh, 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 deep qualms about uh, being more, pro more proactive in security terms. Um, but I think if there's room for a grand bargain, and I've written this before, uh, it should be uh, that France uh, share with Germany uh, its um, uh, nuclear uh, defense deterrent system in, in, in exchange uh, for Germany agreeing uh, to the creation of a common Eurozone budget. Uh, and that, I think, is the basis for creating a broader uh, European uh, integration system. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, we, we, uh, we have talked about macro policy or demand policy, as Martin has called it, as one of the necessary conditions um, for this more um, sovereign um, Europe in, in, in that new world of um, different uh, blocks, geopolitical blocks. Um, I'd like to bring in Clemens Fuß now. Um, is it, would, would you agree, agree that, um, you know, the old system and the old rules um, don't work anymore and we need to, you know, we need to get a new system of um, fiscal policy management on the European level? Your mic is not on? Uh, yes, yeah. uh, no, it should be on. Uh, now, I do agree we need a different framework. I don't think that macroeconomic policies were the main reason for the miseries we have in Europe. We have uh, macroeconomic policies are one part, but we have massive problems uh, in structural policies as well. If, if I look at Italy uh, as an outsider, uh, I mean, 25 years of low growth cannot be explained by uh, uh, macroeconomic policy problems only, that's obvious. So I, I think it's a whole mixture 
of, of problems here, but I totally agree the, the current setup is not uh, conducive to macroeconomic stabilization. I, I think we need a central fund, not the one uh, Macron proposed, but we need a fund that is available in big crises. If we had had this now, uh, uh, we would would have a much better setup um, uh, than than we currently have. I think the next generation EU fund is is a good thing. It will stabilize expectations, but uh, it has cost a lot of political capital. Now, if this goes wrong, if if the recovery goes wrong, there is n I don't have the slightest doubt that the Frugal Four, maybe also uh, parts uh, of the German political establishment, will say, "Look, we gave a lot of money, Germany." gives uh, 60 billion euros, that's a lot of money. If, if, if you look at it, in some ways, it's also not very much money, but people will say, look, we gave a lot of money and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think this is a huge risk. And, and this takes me to Philippe's point. Uh, we, we always return to this issue that we do not, and I, I firmly believe we need the political legitimacy or more common policies. Uh, and the way towards that will have to be some kind of constitutional deal, changing the institutional framework in Europe more towards the federal structure, willingness of France to share its nuclear arms. Uh, and that is the condition, in my view, for Germany to be willing to share uh, or to, to move towards more solidarity financially. It makes no sense at all for Germany to do this without institutional changes and, and without getting something in return. So I think uh, common security policies, including common uh, nuclear armament, uh, it would be a very important step if, if I mean, all, many of our problems are related to that. If we just discussed the, EC, the ECB ruling of the German Constitutional Court, it was, I'm not a lawyer, but it was completely logical. The EU is not a federation. There is no federal layer where we have a court that says what the federal government do and can't do. Uh, the, the sovereignty of the EU rests on the member states. And if the EU or EU institutions overstep their mandate, the, the national constitutional courts act. That's at least how the national courts see it, and it's perfectly logical. I, 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 I'm aware that it creates a lot of, uh, as I think Maria said, it creates uncertainty. Of course it does. But the European, uh, uh, the constitutional court had to act given its understanding of the entire judicial setup. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So uh, I think we need uh, to start with a constitutional reform. What we're seeing a lot of in Europe is say, okay, we don't have the institutions, we don't have the legitimacy. Um, we, we have um, a rule saying there is no monetary financing uh, of, a governments, of government deficits. It's the basis of the contract. Uh, we have we have a no bailout rule. It's 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 uh, this was the contract uh, we 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 signed when we created this eurozone. It was a, a condition for Germany to join. Of course, you can say it's a stupid contract, but that's what the rules are. And and I think uh, we need to change the rules first. We cannot change uh, you know what we do and then um, uh, be uh, be disappointed when the courts say what you're doing is undemocratic. It's wrong. Mm. We need to change the constitutional framework, and once we've done that, uh, I think we can make progress. I, I agree with Martin's fundamental point. We are we are stuck in the eurozone uh, uh, in a very uncomfortable situation, but we need to we need to address that. We cannot get around that. Lucas, did you want? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. On, on on this point, I think political union will never come with a big flag where it says we are now in political union. Political union is, I think, a state that we reach at the point where debates at the European level are in a way politicized, um, that, that cater for some real democratic debate on, on policy questions. And I'm not sure we are not there yet. Um, I think that the, the whole debate we have now on the recovery fund um, has shown, A, we have a capacity to act, which is really fast at the European level if we need to. Um, and I think the debates we will see in the next year over, over how this money will be spent um, will be crucial um, to see whether we have now a European debate space for how this money is used and what kind of you know, reforms and investment that will um, finance on the, at the national level. And we have proposed in, in the summer to get the European Parliament more involved in this, and I think it's an imperfect process. 
but I think that is a point where we get much closer to what we would call a political union. And I'm also not sure whether we really need a constitutional reform, as, as, as Clemens put it, um, which would mean completely overhaul the institutions. I think our main problem in the last years has been with policy outcomes um, rather than with the lacking institutional structure to decide things. Um, we can discuss about the areas where we need like, to move away from unanimity, but uh, truth be told, we have a lot of areas where we can already decide with, with qualified majority. Um, I think um, if we have to change something, it's the question about the financial resources we have at the European level. But I think in theory, we have the institutions to decide on that. We have a European parliament that already can decide on, on the European budget. Um, and I have no doubt that if the parliament would have more power in, in certain areas, it would also get better people for these areas, as we see in the areas where there are already legislative files. So I'm not sure it's really about the institutions. I think it's about having a political discourse at the European level and about changing policy outcomes. I'd like to uh, talk a little about this point, though, that um, do, do we agree here in, in, on this panel that um, we need a change of the basic contract of the constitution in order to get to uh, the policies we agree that are needed or do we think it can be done as Lucas has, chat, has said uh, at a, on a more incremental level you know it, it, we can just model, model our way through and to, to reach that point what what are the opinions yeah Okay, um, I think, sorry, I would like to react to the idea of structural problems and Italy not growing for 25 years. Um, just uh, some pieces of, of statistical information. Up to the beginning of the 90s, uh, the rate of growth and of growth of GDP and productivity in Italy was on average extremely close to those of Germany, it was the same. So, then there was an extremely abrupt change, uh, right, say between 93 and 95, uh, in both trends, productivity and GDP. What happened? So it must have been something happening in those years, very, you know, because it has been a, a, an abrupt change in trends. And what happened in those years are several things, most of which are related to uh, the creation of the Eurozone or going towards the creation of the Eurozone. The first thing is, since then, since the beginning of the 90s, Italy always ran a surplus in primary public budget for 30 years. This has slowed up growth terribly, okay? Then, uh, also productivity growth depends very much on GDP growth. This is, again, something that everybody now tends to recognize, most economists tend to recognize, so the two things are not related, with a causal link that goes to a large extent at least from GDP growth to productivity and not vice versa. This is the old Caldorian idea of um, Albert Dorn idea, and you know, there is a lot of literature on that. The second thing that happened is that we had the reform of wage uh, fixing that increased the, you know, sort of lower, further lower the, the wage share, which also is not completely, uh, you know, unrelated to, to European policies. We had uh, finally fixed exchange rate, which was probably not the correct one for Italy, which also um, discouraged, let's say, or diminished the potentialities in terms of exports and increased imports. So there were a number of change in income distribution, macroeconomic policy, exchange rate, which are not are related. And also there were a lot of privatization of public firms, some of which were very um, strong into in research and development, uh, you know, new technologies, etc. So these things, however, are not are related to the European framework. The other thing about the graduality or not, I don't know, but of course, uh, reforming the rules in Europe takes a lot of time because there is no agreement and is a very long process. In the meantime, if you don't have the proper, the appropriate monetary policy, the Eurozone simply will, will, will break up. So one has to decide. 
<laughs> what if if you want the euro or you don't want it if you want it probably the change in policy has to be fast while the changing rules unfortunately is often very slow this is another problem with the european construction that decisions are very slow but often the reality requires that decisions are fast so <laughs> it's a problem yeah uh, i mean the, so the on the other hand, if I look in the, at the US and the budget debates and fights there, they're always also not always the quickest in terms of taking um, decisions. So maybe that's also just a feature of, you know, politics in a large federation or even in a large um, single uh, monolithic states where you have um, a, fed, uh, a, a lender or, or, or um, states that want to interfere. On the, just, oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to pick up on, this US Europe, because I have a view which is sort of split down the middle between the two views taken here, whether we need absolutely fundamental reform or things can be left as they are, as it were. Um, I argued in a piece, which um, Clements will, must have really hated it, but never mind. Uh, uh, if you allow the ECB to do what it's now doing, which is, and I quote from somebody at, and a high level at the ECB, but I won't say who it is, of course, uh, to act as the central bank, the national central bank of each member, then, uh, which of course the Fed doesn't have to do because it can deal with, with federal assets. So that's a crucial difference, mm -hmm. right? You, know, you could imagine the Fed, if there was no federal government with federal debt and Hamilton never existed, that they essentially, the Fed was acting to buy the debt of every state. And I was, you know, could imagine that, but the US doesn't have to do this. The ECB does. If you allow the, the central bank to intervene in this way in a crisis, and a crisis situation will be defined generously, and it can do so on an enormous scale. And if you additionally add the sort of fund, fund that you've just produced and make it effective, then you have gone quite a long way to make the system work in a crisis. Quite a long way. And I was very appreciative. But of course, Clement can rightly say that this is pushing, to put it mildly, the limits of the contract. And I'm putting it very mildly, so I'm not surprised by the German reaction. So my point would be, yes, you can make this operate, but you can only do so by acting arguably, arguably ultra vires. That's a very uncomfortable situation to be in the long run, which is why I tend to think that in the long run, Clement is right. There has to be a constitutional settlement. Clement, if, if I may add to, to this, uh, what Martin just said, and also to, to what Lucas said, uh, of, of course, I'm, I'm not naive. I don't think there's going to be a big re institutional reform tomorrow. Uh, and in, in some way, I think that what Martin just describes is really what's going on. Uh, if, at the beginning of this debate, we discussed, you know, why did, why did the German government suddenly uh, support this fund rather than uh, making a lot of fuss? Now, my understanding is that there has finally been uh, an awareness in the German government that the crisis will go as follows. Now, if Germany insists on, uh, you know, hard budget constraints and, and all the rules, what will happen is uh, at some point a crisis will come, you know, a country like Greece will face uh, exit from the Eurozone and then the you know, irrespective of whether it is a good idea or a bad idea that the country leaves the Eurozone, uh, the German government will say, oh, this is highly unattractive. As it said in 2013, it's highly unattractive to have a big short-term crisis for maybe, uh, you know, long-term benefit or long-term damage or whatever it is. Uh, so uh, it is cheaper uh, to not even let it get there and, 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 you know, and to prevent it in the first place. I think that was what, you know, uh, in a way, a lesson uh, from the first crisis. So if you insist on these rules, you will, you have to be ready to go through with it. And in some ways, that's, you know, that, that's the decision between <laughs> facing a massive common pool problem, which we face, of course, in Europe. Martin just described this. It's, it's not just breaking contract. Uh, economically, 
we are facing a massive common pool problem. If, if everybody can call the ECB and say, hey, can you print me some money? I need some money. This is an absurd situation. It's a massive common pool problem. So this can only work if there is an implicit understanding not uh, you know strict rules there must be some kind of implicit understanding okay you know we will do this but we will not exaggerate mm -hmm. at some point you know we will all you know protect our common currency uh, and my impression is you know that is the, the kind of equilibrium we're in now a bit fragile but you could argue you know it's not so bad it breaches the law our lawyer friends will not like it uh, it is not legitimate uh, but uh, you know it's acceptable for everybody it's pragmatic Mm. And if it's acceptable, maybe it's also legitimate in some way. You know? I mean, there are different sources of legitimacy and um, the, the law is only one source. It has to be interpreted. <laughs> you can discuss that with the lawyers. Yeah, with the lawyers. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, also on this point, so, so Martin um, uh, uh, raised two conditions. So the ECB does what is necessary and there's some sort of European-wide fund, right? Um, I want to talk about national uh, budget rules, right? Are, um, is it necessary in order to get to that stability without you know, the big grand bargain for, to get to that stability, stability to also reform national budget rules? So do we have to get rid of the 60%? Does it have to be 90%? Do we have to get, it, to get rid of it altogether? Or would that be then the overdoing it as, as Clemens has just mentioned? If we change the growth and stability pact? Nobody's going to pay any attention to them in my view. They're dead. I don't know what Clement's saying. I think they're dead. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I agree. I, I think it hasn't been, I mean, people keep saying, okay, we had to cut the deficit in 2013 because it, there were the rules. Nobody, and even in 13, nobody cared about the rules. I think, I think that's simply wrong. The EU didn't force anybody to cut budget deficits. Uh, it was more uh, a matter of, uh, well, maybe a matter of a conflict with, the, with Brussels uh, making the capital markets unhappy. That was more it, but, uh, and I think now at the moment, nobody, I mean, people are taking it seriously even less. I mean, I would be in favor of having a discussion, reforming it, um, uh, but we, we should, what we should absolutely do is stick to national budget rules just because we need a commitment to solid public finances. If, if we abolish this all, my fear would be that investors will lose confidence. So I, I, I think we need a long-term commitment to, you know, protecting the ECB from, uh, you know, being, being dominated by fiscal policy. Uh, and, and I wouldn't be against, uh, you know, sitting down. Uh, it cannot be made worse. I mean, there's nothing left of these rules uh, and, and it cannot be made, made worse. So why not try to make it a little, a little more credible? Clement, every central bank is dominated by fiscal. It has suffering from fiscal dominance. There's no European problem. So and contrary, to what, and contrary to what Clement said, there was huge pressure on national governments. Uh, and it, that came from um, the ECB playing, um, uh, uh, trespassing actually into, into that role and saying, well, you know, unless um, uh, you impose massive pro-cyclical pro austerity, we're not going to act to quell uh, the panic uh, in bond markets. And ultimately, um, uh, the ECB blinked in 2012 because it realized that that would be the end of the Eurozone unless it did intervene and, and Draghi had the acquiescence of Michael by that stage to do it. But the idea that there wasn't um, it was purely a capital markets thing, and it was just um, there was no pressure at all on national governments. It simply uh, it isn't true. Um, no, so it wasn't coming from the fiscal rules. I agree. It wasn't coming. I mean, the ECB wants to protect itself. I agree, and they put pressure, but it's not the uh, it's not the, the the fiscal rules. You know, the three percent rule. It's a capital markets, absolutely, and the ECB is working very hard to kill that. <laughs> of yeah. course. Yeah. Agree. Uh, Lucas, you wanted to comment? Yeah, I would. I would agree with Kim to the extent that I don't think any particular Commission decision had a particularly strong impact on budget in the member states. But of course, there was a political consensus in 2011, 2012 that was very much in favor of fiscal consolidation. And I think that is the question: like, what kind of political consensus do we get in the eurozone mm -hmm. after the crisis? And to come back to my earlier point, I did want to say that like, everything is fine in the Eurozone, but I think it's a question fundamentally of majorities 
um, among member states and even in the European Parliament for the one or the other political outcome. Um, and I think that why, that's why the German position is so important. And we saw when France and Germany have a common position that both sides really support and really are after, and then that makes a huge difference, even within the, the current political institution, uh, with the current institution set up, then a lot of things are possible. And I think that's true for the fiscal rules and that's true for um, a, a potential common fiscal policy further down the road. And so this is what I meant with like, it's about the policy outcomes much more than about the institutional constitutional structure. Yeah, but aren't we, aren't we then um, back at, at the question of legitimacy, right? I mean, if what Martin says is right, that every central bank is ultimately controlled are dominated by its um, state, um, then probably it's uh, more difficult to accept that for Germans in this case, uh, if the central bank is not the Bundesbank, but the European central bank, and it's dominated by the Italian uh, state and not by the German state. So in a way, you know, uh, is, is it a problem of this uh, strange thing that the EU area actually is, which is composed of different member states with different national loyalties and so on. And so a lot of stuff which is easy in a national context is a lot more difficult in the European context politically and... Uh, absolutely. I mean, if it's your own central bank, you don't have a problem. I mean, the Bundesbank would always have bailed out, uh, I completely agree, the German government, of course. It was independent, but it would always have bailed out the German government. But the ECB cannot do that unless we want to create a massive common pool problem. And that's our, that's our difficulty. So, I mean, here is, a here is a suggestion. I mean, in this current situation, without the big institutional reform, if we look at the coming years, uh, one way forward would be to say, okay, let's implicitly agree on forgetting about budgetary roles for a moment uh, and uh, focus more on spending paths. Uh, so we all agree, okay, to get back to growth, we need reasonable public investment. Uh, we don't want to cut back um, uh, public spending. Uh, overly, but we should have a debate in Europe about what, how, how the public, how the spending paths are going, uh, and uh, also about public investment. One d big disappointment could be that the next generation EU isn't used to increase public investment. I think that shouldn't happen. So if we had a debate on public spending and not so much on, on public debt for a limited amount of time, and that might be a way forward. And then when the economy recovers, because I mean that has to be the objective capital markets believing that uh, the debt ratios will go down in the medium term, that the debt will be serviced, uh, and uh, growth somehow coming back. Uh, and to achieve that, I think we need a long-term commitment to fiscal solidity, but uh, an interim time for the, for, for the recovery where we focus more on spending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maria, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, if you were to go back to the rationale behind the fiscal rules, I mean, I think there is no doubt that these rules just don't work. But the rationale for the rules was the need for coordination, not only for fiscal coordination, but at some point to have a fiscal monetary coordination. Now, we don't have the fiscal monetary coordination because we don't have the sovereign uh, the status at the EU. Um, but at least on the fiscal side, the, the, there was a good reason why we had those rules in the, Maastricht, uh, in the Maastricht sense. It's important that one country doesn't put other countries and the whole union at, at peril. I mean, th that rationale surely hasn't gone. If anything, is reinforced. I mean, now the question is, how do you achieve that? If you don't want to achieve that through some other rules, you could do it through the, uh, the investment discussions that we can have that uh, Clemens just uh, talked about. Yeah. But, the, end, but the, the, the fact remains that this conversation will always be liable to the political cycle. And political cycles in Europe are not synchronized. I mean, they go in different ways and they react to different things. So we will meet this problem ahead of us. I think it's important not to lose kind of the, the woods from the forest here, that the, you know, uncoordinated fiscal policies will always be a danger for the project and the question is how do you coordinate best to allow for growth uh, but at the same time not uh, uh, not impose rules that are simply not not good yeah. okay if there are no more comments i would like to thank you for that um, stimulating and deep debate uh, i learned a lot i hope you also learned something uh, it was a pleasure to to chair this panel um and i'll hand over to thomas right now for closing remarks i guess what? Yes, thanks a lot, Mark, for, for this uh, moderation and this excellent uh, panel. Um, very much uh, appreciated. Uh, let me just use the last couple of minutes to, to uh, sum up uh, a little bit what we've been doing. The objective of this workshop over two year, over three days in the, in the end has been to discuss the 
what are the big uh, challenges for Germany and what are maybe the first answers to having a new model, another model, a better model of German, uh, the German economy in search of a new paradigm. That's the guiding idea that we have in mind that seems to be needed. And all that just some days uh, before uh, the 30th anniversary of uh, unification, which uh, we'll have on, on Saturday, which allowed us to ask the question in the historical question, is there the need, a need of a renewal of capitalism? which seems in a question that is not completely out of, uh, out of the range, as, at least as we uh, look at the numbers from, from a poll that we did with Forza, where it seemed where only not even 10% of Germans say we're, we're okay with our economic system as it is. And there seems to be a lot of, um, of issues that we have to address. We had a lot of, uh, really big highlights um, and I'm quite happy with that we have I mean it's probably not so often that Joe Stieglitz is discussing with an acting uh, fi fi finance minister at least not with a German one uh, that has probably been the, the first one um, for, for a long time and having Olaf Scholz uh, yesterday to discuss at, at a day when he presented his budget at the Bundestag uh, was something which we very much appreciated and that a, uh, an acting German finance minister openly discusses in English with a Nobel Prize laureate like uh, just Stieglitz was uh, a real highlight and, and very inspiring. Uh, as well as Thomas Piketty who has uh, highlighted the German innovation side, social innovations in Germany contrary to, to what international perception of Germany of the very German, uh, of a more conservative German policy is, we had a talk with, uh, I was talking with uh, Jens Spahn, one of the leading figures of the CDU of German conservatives, signaling very clearly that he also sees a need for renewal of the understanding of what the state has to do and not to do, and something which uh, touches social issues and um, globalization he's talking about. So that seems to enter this, I mean, the, what we're talking about, the new paradigm, is entering also parties that uh, doesn't seem to be at the forefront of, of such thinking. Um, we had not only these big figures, but also very ex excellent in, in inputs, allowing us to go forward in, in better understanding what could be the new economic model or another better bon um, economic model. We had an excellent paper and an excellent discussion um, on the role of housing in inequality in Germany, which seems to be crucial and uh, a very important insight on for us to go and, and find the real efficient answers of how to cope and how to handle inequality questions in a broader sense, not only in income terms, but also in, in wealth terms and, and chances and, and so on. We had an excellent input with uh, some um, very concrete ideas from Michael Hüter and Jens Südekom on how to reform Germany's fiscal policy very concretely with some ideas of reforming the debt break, um, which is work in progress. Uh, both will work on it in the next few days and weeks and introduce uh, insights from the discuss from the discussion yesterday. We had a real important, I think a very important input from Mayana Matsukati and her team as sort of a blueprint on how to make climate policies much more consistently part of a coherent economic policy and industrial policy, introducing both sides, competitiveness and climate issues, um, sustainability issues. Uh, that's, I think, very promising and also work in, in, in progress. And we had some really big insights on the future of the German industry, as well as this discussion we just had on the Eurozone and another discussion to, uh, this morning on populism. For everyone who couldn't uh, follow these discussions, we will have them all on website, on our website again. You can all follow each of them, them again. We will have... A, work on these studies because they are, this is really big work uh, that we will continue. We would, for example, have a third stage on inequality, having analyzed the drivers of inequality. Now, next stage will be how, to, if we better understand the, the relative importance of different drivers of inequality, how can we then design an efficient 
uh, policy that copes with inequality issues. We will have a, now prepare an agenda, research agenda for 2020, and for anyone who wants to suggest whatever you think will be important for, for us to take into account, that's the moment to bring in. Uh, next year will be very much under the impression of the German federal election, so that we want to touch the main issues. Inequality might be one, but the Eurozone, the Euro question is another one that we need to address more uh, in this next time. And we want to focus again, that's something we talked about in the morning, on narratives and, and paradigm shifts, because I think the understanding of these issues narratives and paradigms is very crucial to, to design a better and new policy. Um, concretely, we will next week have a, a seminar which will, will be interesting for you all, I think, and you mentioned the name Hamilton. We have a, a seminar on the Hamilton moment together with Jakob von Weizsäcker and Agnes uh, de uh, Benassi de Curé. Uh, so the, both chief economist French and, and um, German from finance ministries. Uh, and some excellent people like Lucas will be there, um, and you're invited all to, to join. We will send you invitations also, uh, which will be a very small, a, a very small, a smaller group of experts discussing: Is that has that been in Hamilton moment? And, and these questions that we already touched this morning. So, uh, thanks for anyone who has contributed to this. Um, we had a big challenge, which was the first real hybrid conference that we did and maybe what some of you will have touches for us it was real new it's easy to have a presence in person workshop i mean it's not easy but we know how to do it we had good uh, experience with uh, only um, virtual uh, events like the one that we have now the session that we had now having both together is a real challenge and i have to thank my team uh anna Tora, mark and julia for excellent work i mean we had already some feedback uh you're working on on this you had done a tremendous job uh, we were on twitter and uh youtube and any challenge that challenge uh, ch uh, channel that you can Im imagine and uh, we tried, I mean, there were some problems sometimes to bring in the people online and real, but I think we did it quite, quite okay. Hopefully, uh, we will not need to continue these kinds of exercises forever, but some of these will continue, I think, and it's, it's good. I mean, we spent less time, in, uh, we can have spend more time uh, this way and, and less in travel. But still, I enjoyed yesterday to have people around and not only on, on, on the screens. So that was um, excellent. I thank again everyone. And as I know that both hopefully are still online, I want to thank the last word, Caio, Caio Kochweser and Johannes Meyer, who are both online, as I saw, who are, have been both the ones that have been at the origin and the, the core of this idea. It is more or less four years ago, and it reminds that what we had to listen to last night. Um, it was quite immediately after, some days or weeks after the uh, pre presidential election in the US uh, and Trump election, and it was quite soon, some time after the Brexit vote, um, vote um, that we started to think, and uh, Johannes and Caio um, very much, uh, to think about the need for such an initiative to think about a new paradigm and new thinking to cope with this um, um, populism. And to conclude, just a, a word, Martin, I'm, I think we're in most things we are I'm, I'm in line with what we're thinking, except for the Euro. I think if you listen to what has happened in the US last night uh, and you should look at these pictures, I, until now, we're not in the, in the, in the worst shape in Europe. Uh, so we have avoided such a catastrophe like uh, the US has in political and, and the UK. So maybe it's not all wrong what the Eurozone has done and uh, maybe we're on the right way to, to a better, better world. So thanks a lot and enjoy the, the day and uh, see you soon uh, back again. Thanks to all. Thank you. Bye-bye.